Well, I think there's an enormous amount of news lately. You folks found quite a few things I hadn't seen, and I've been making a ridiculous number of news links per day. I it's hard to narrow down the choices. There are so many. It is. Irvin and I had the, had the same idea, though. Well, yeah, but still. There's, I think anyway, the so cell phone one, because I, I, I found that one very interesting, too. Or was it a different one that you guys picked the same one? Uh, Caitlin? Anyway. Yeah. Was it the right. Sophos one? No, no, it was the it was, Comcast one. Yeah, Comcast. Oh. Anyway, so Liz, you got parking meter vendors. Is this the San Francisco parking meters? Uh, no, this is another city's parking meters. Uh, so um, this was actually for, but I, you know, that said, it was the, this was Milwaukee, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was uh, San Francisco was on the same um, system because that's, that's how these companies tend to work. They all tend to go with the same like one or two firms uh, across the country to implement these systems. So I'm sure this is an issue elsewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, the, essentially this, uh, these, these um, smart meters, the vendor for the, the parking meters got hacked and it, a huge data dump, including credit card numbers and everything else uh, that people had used to park either at city garages or um, at the meters. And uh, so people who have parked their car in Milwaukee using a credit card need to uh, need to go ahead and check their uh, check their statements and probably change all their passwords. So um, they leak credit cards, uh, credit cards, and and any other kind of PII. Uh, they basically got a dump of the whole database. So um, thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and and their concern, you know, one of the concerns with this is is that. Um, they got, uh, since they got into the database, I'm guessing they were using some kind of city employees stolen credentials. And uh, concern is here that they're gonna be able to get into other city systems um, through, this, uh, through this attack. <laughs> so um, pretty interesting. A lot of, a lot of municipalities are, are getting, um, getting attacked right now. So what's the kill chain? I thought ransomware was typically somebody clicks on a link, you get the ransomware, it encrypts stuff. But these guys, I guess they hack in first, steal the stuff, and then put ransomware? Because normally you don't get data theft along with ransomware. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, sometimes, it, it, you know, especially if... Uh, you know, if you can uh, exfiltrate a bunch of data and then... Um, use it to get into people's accounts, then why not do both? You know, they, they essentially um, got the, uh, got the company, they got the city to pay. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can't just steal the, um, steal the database dumps that they, they found as well. It also makes sense that, that the actual device itself was poorly created so that it does phone home. Mm -hmm. So if you can get to that device, you basically have the door in straight into their internal network and be able to get all this kind of info out. So did they hack into the devices themselves or just the server? I think they hacked into the server. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't, um, they didn't, uh, they weren't able to do that be, because they hacked the device. It doesn't say how the uh, attack happened necessarily, but you could, you know, for example, you could um, uh, figure out what the connection protocol is, um, you know, insert yourself in the middle, uh, and then, um, you know, perhaps, you know, a lot of the times these things do stupid things like uh, use hard-coded uh, database credentials that aren't encrypted. Right. Um, so, so that would be a good good uh, attack vector. Um, one thing I noticed was that the, in the article was that they said they only exposed some of the files they had. So, you know, one theory I had was maybe they got ransomware, but not enough. So they only exposed part of the um, part of the data they had access to. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Sort yeah. of a, you know, sort of a, in a in an effort to say like, oh well. Look what we did, and we'll we'll uh, publish the rest if you don't pay up. Yeah, yeah. Well, it makes sense. I'd like to see more information about how this happens. I know we often don't get that. Yeah.
they're going to do something about the CFAA. Wow, this is awesome. Yeah, the, uh, the Supreme Court is going to take up the CFAA battle. So for those of you who don't know, uh, this is normally the law that's used against you when you break the terms of service or you do something you shouldn't, like cybersecurity research. And, it, you know, instead of slap on the wrist, it's throw you in jail because you did something criminal. So that is finally going to go up to the Supreme Court. You know, this is exactly what, what needs to happen. We need to have a bunch of 70 and 80 year old uh, <laughs> people trying to decide uh, cutting edge uh, internet and computer hacking uh, uh, rules and, and laws. Well, I, I mean, I talked to them about this, the Department of Justice officials and the head of the cyber crime guy, the FBI and stuff. And they all told me about two years ago at B-Sides, there was no chance of this happening because there's no interest in the federal government at lowering computer crime prosecutions, quite the opposite. Everybody wants to be tough on crime. So uh, this is very interesting. I thought it I'd is. like to hear see what comes of it. Yeah. yeah. I'll, be very, I'll be very surprised if this goes through, but yep. we'll see. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they normally come out with their the decisions in June, if I'm not mistaken. Well, and now they're very much swayed toward the right wing, but that might be good because of the pro-business aspect. And we'll see what comes of this. Right. Yeah. I so think we'll know in, in about June when, the, when they come out with all their rulings. Yeah, yeah. I know uh, one pattern I've seen in all these legal things is it hits an interesting topic and everybody gets excited, and then it turns out that that exact case had some little technicality, so they don't actually touch the big important issue we all want to hear about. Um, so I wouldn't get your hopes too much up, but anyway. I think it just depends on how it gets presented. Um, you know, if they present it under the context that it's by, na by narrowing the scope, it's going to be um, easier to effectively uh, prosecute um, scoff laws, then they might end up pushing it through. You know, it, it, it's, it's interesting how, um, you know, for lack of a better term, the way these, uh, this, the, this type of legislation is, you know, quote unquote, marketed to, uh, to the judges makes a huge difference because um, just like Caitlin said, you know, in so many words, like most of these people are pretty technologically inept. So, they rely on, um, you know, sort of the testimony of experts to help them make the uh, rulings. They so, do. Yeah, it just, it just depends on who gets in there. Yep. And I think it also depends on uh, security experts cooperating with government officials and helping them understand this stuff, which I think yeah, is... exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. All right. And then we got Microsoft Teams. Oh, this is an right. alternative, right? Right. So in the corporate world, uh, what a lot of what a lot of uh, people are using is Microsoft Teams for their work at home kind of com communication, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to Zoom or some of the other popular uh, applications. Um, and recently, there was a security vulnerability uh, in Teams. And and so, of course, the reason why a bunch of corporations are using Teams is because it's supposedly more secure than zoom or skype or all the other video chatting things plus it has like built-in like irc type chat and stuff um anyway uh there's a, there was a bug in the way that it loads images basically it would send an auth token with the image that would essentially have your like login credentials and you can intercept that uh or set up a fake domain uh to gra grab those tokens and then impersonate other users so you trick people into clicking on a link or the GIF just- You don't even, they don't even have to click. It just wow. loads automatically. Wow. And then it sends the, the token to a server that you can control. Yeah, the, uh, the person that manages uh, Sam's and I, our, our department, uh, when the Zoom stuff started coming out, he said, oh, we should just use Microsoft Teams instead because that's totally secure. And I'm just like, oh. Uh, Oh, dude. I mean, it's more secure, <laughs> dude. <laughs> it's, it's more. It, it is, and, and and to be fair, it is a hard attack to pull off. You have to essentially do some DNS, you know, takeovers and and stuff like that. But it's possible. Um, and and Microsoft already patched this, 
So, I mean, they're, they're on top of it. Okay. Well, you know, I was thinking about my military job and we just used the telephone and Skype to share the desktop. And that seems to be fine, but you don't get the video. Right. Well, I guess you could get the video, but they don't. Anyway, that's interesting. What about SharePoint? Isn't that another? Microsoft, as usual, has like five products that all seem to do the same thing. SharePoint is not the same thing as Teams. Teams is more like um, Slack meets Zoom, Okay. essentially. Um, whereas SharePoint is more like setting up your own website to share data. Yeah, okay. Well, all right, and now I got, um, so this is all over the security Twitter sphere. Um, every, the military products to, that were designed to catch criminals and such are now all being repurposed to track coronavirus. And so the same privacy advocates that have hated them all along now hate this too. Um, so um, Celebrite, for example, which is the uh, iPhone hacking company. I met the CEO, they're really powerful. They can hack in every iPhone and Android. And now they're talking about how to use their software to track all the phones. And um, it could be done with consent, but it'll depend on the laws. Some countries are requiring it. And there are other, but the thing that I really got it, was very interested in was Apple shoving Germany around. Germany wanted to track all the uh, infected coronavirus people with an app that they would force everybody to install. And they decided to go with the European standard, which is this uh, HAP or something. There's, a, there's an abbreviation huh. I'm, from, I'm not, not finding here, but there's a European standard that, um, for privacy, which has a central server that knows everything. And Apple wrote an API that will not let you do that. It will not let you export the Bluetooth to a central server. It says all you can do is have a local thing, phone to phone, to ensure privacy. And Germany switched to that to go along with Apple. So they're being shoved around by Apple. And Apple is continuing their big privacy um, stance, which has been, ever since their fight with the FBI, Apple has been the champion of the most extreme form of complete privacy for their users. And here it is really winning, I think, in the marketplace. So anyway, it is a big issue. Everybody wants to have a coronavirus tracking app and they're having all the usual battles over the various ways of doing it. And the two main ways to do it are just a local anonymized number where only your phone knows who you've been near, but only, and the other one is where there's some central server that knows everything about everybody. Anyway. I saw, uh, I saw a uh, sort of something that involved the first method that uh, I thought sounded pretty good. I think it was Australia was um, trying to implement this, but uh, essentially the way it worked was that it may saved all the data locally on your device until um, you call in sick. Um, and, and at the point that you like mark yourself as sick or you're marked as sick in the database, then it actually um, uploads your, your contacts to the server. What could possibly go wrong with that? This is it, yeah. and European privacy preserving proximity tracing. Like most government names, that's the one that is not privacy preserving. <laughs> so that's the way to learn Microsoft names and government names. They always mean the opposite of what they are. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so we'll see what comes to that. I'm sure we're all going to be hearing a lot more about that. Yeah. And so they're spoofing the SBA. Yes. Uh, so this I thought was a pretty interesting story. Um, you know, all of the uh, various uh, coronavirus relief um, efforts are, hackers are hopping on those uh, opportunities. Um, I saw a few other ones that one of the other ones was with uh, like unemployment uh, checks. They're essentially, in this case, um, they're pretending to be the um, pretending to be the small business association sending out um sending out uh phishing emails and uh you know once the once the uh target um is a is a successful uh as a successful vis uh victim of the phishing campaign they get a rat installed uh on their system and um you know, this one I thought is pretty bad because in a, in a lot of ways, um, you know, the government has much like, much like our, our uh, college, the government has a problem with centralizing 
and uh, making information consistent for people to access. So, um, you know, the whole small business loan bailout system has been a real cluster. And um, I think that the, the, I can see why this would be successful because there are a lot of desperate um, small and medium business owners out there just trying to do anything they can to um, save their business and save their employees. So this one's particularly bad because they can end up getting um, uh, infiltrating business, these business systems on top of it. And, you know, with a, a, the uh, resulting cascade of, of uh, fails involved. So. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard about this, the, uh, the loan programs, the first one, they just gave money to banks who just gave it to whoever they liked. And the second one, they just put up a website and made it first come, first served. So everybody desperately jumped on and then the server crashes. And yep. I've heard the same thing's true if you want to get unemployment. All the state agencies can't handle the load. So they say it takes like 150 phone calls to get in. It's just spectacular how much our government is completely useless at the national level. It, uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's just shocking. Um, and, and I mean, I think that this is, this is going to continue now. The whole, the, this whole um, small business loan bailout program has just been a, a circus from the start. Um, you know, we all saw the stories last week with like Ruth Chris getting $20 million, um, which they, you know, in all fairness, they, they agreed to give back, but um, and Harvard. there have been a lot of scenarios like that where the banks just opened up these loans uh, to big businesses first because they got to decide who they wanted to give it to. Right. Um, and uh, so they, hand, they dispersed all this money. And then by the time they opened up the loan applications to small businesses, there was no money left. So yeah. there are a lot of those going out of business here in the Bay Area. Yeah. All right. And then... SQL injection phones still around. <laughs> yep. So any device at the at the time, I, I believe it's already patched now. Uh, but uh, anybody with an XG firewall unit that had a, the administration interface on, or basically the web page on, you could do a SQL I on it. Mm -hmm. A pre auth SQL I. And then you could get uh, code injection. Yeah. 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 So. And can you tell? Anyway, it's nice that uh, they're so open about it. The, the Sophos, enterprise class Sophos product, boy. Sophos has been hacked so many times. Well, I mm -hmm. remember they sent me a free iPad about eight years ago. And at that time is when Vince Chaviso took them down totally because they criticized him. He dumped a bunch of Microsoft phones without giving them enough time to respond, or as the claim was. So the Sophos put up a blog saying, this guy is irresponsible. So to punish them, he hacked their software. And it was bloody awesome. He found that you could totally take over your Mac through the Sophos antivirus. He found like 14 elementary fatal flaws. And Sophos had this very polite response. Oh, thank you so much for letting us know about these important things and we'll fix them right away. And, and then they sent me an iPad. There's like a drawing someplace. Sign up and get an iPad. They mailed me an iPad. And then they sent me all these emails saying, you've got a free iPad, which of course my spam filter threw away. And then they finally reached my Twitter. Why are you transferring our emails? We're giving you a free iPad. I said, yeah, sure you are. And they actually gave me one. Then they said, you should pose for a picture with it so we can use it in promotion. So I did. And when they saw me, they didn't use the picture. They said, oh, <laughs> so I gave it to one of my students anyway. But it was... I've always felt like Sophos is like way too dumb to be in this business. They just seem to be clowns as far as I can tell, but I didn't even know they made enterprise class products. Anyway, they got to, they got to fight with people like Palo Alto and all the others. I've heard a lot of good things about Palo Alto. Although I must say Cisco, which is the leader seems to be doing incredible number of stupid things. You get caught like eight times hard coded passwords. Yep. So yeah. I don't know, maybe Sophos is up to the real standards of the industry and I had a false belief in their security. <laughs> anyway, at least they fixed it. So GOG Galaxy, what in the world is right. GOG Galaxy? So GOG Galaxy. Um, so there are a few kind of app stores for the desktop. Of course you have the Microsoft store and the Apple store, but you also have a few boutiques, particularly ones that focus on gaming software. And the two big ones for that are, well, you have like, you know, EA, you have uh, Steam. Uh, GOG stands for Good Old Games. And they're a 
software store that focuses on older software, uh, making it really easy to run things like your old DOS games under modern Unix or, or Windows systems. And um, they're, they're very popular in particular because they don't believe in like DRM. Well, and privileges. wait a minute. Right, right. This now now they, they have, now because they are a software vendor and with a software store, they run a local application on your system with system privileges so that they can install software, do updates, that kind of stuff. Um, they kind of sort of left a private key in their, <laughs> their system, uh, which you can oh. get, <laughs> you can extract, um, and you can send it commands and hash it using HMAC uh, uh, signatures um, uh, with that private key to send it commands to run anything you want to system. They're so nice. They're so thoughtful. And, but it's only listening on local ports, not remotely, right? It's listening remotely. Oh, so you can totally take over anybody's machine who has this thing installed? I don't know every, anybody's machine, but you can definitely take over your own machine or a target machine. Because this said is listing on local host. That makes me think maybe not. Anyway, that's pretty but, good. I like, well, I like, yeah. I like the, uh, the reverse engineering details here. Mm -hmm. It's like a good project. Did he tell them? Did they do anything about it? I did. I don't think they have done anything about it yet. I think. I didn't see him anything about them telling them. Oh yes, yes. At the end, I initially contacted okay. Gog Support, made the request, and they acknowledged it. Yep. And said it was given a low priority. Uh, um, a low priority. They released an update. They updated something. Right. They improved security. Uh, well, okay, it's very unclear, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. But they didn't like totally ignore him or prosecute him or anything. Oh, no. Well, that's better than some people. <laughs> right. So this, you know, I'm watching, of course, like everybody, the coronavirus thing. And we had this huge expensive lockdown to get time. And as far as I can tell, we did absolutely nothing with this time. I mean, the point of this time, now one thing that did happen, of course, is it prevents the hospitals from getting flooded if you smear out the patients. But other than that, I thought we were supposed to be setting up some kind of contact tracing or some kind of way to be safer. And as far as I can tell, we have done none of that. There is no app. There are not any enough tests to find out who has it. There should be a fleet of 100,000 people doing contact tracing. None of that has happened. So as far as I can tell, we paid an incredible amount of money to buy like two months of time with which we did absolutely nothing to prepare for opening. And now we're just going to open anyway without doing any of the preparation. So it is kind of crazy. I'm just, it is spectacular how much our, our leaders seem to just have no idea what they're doing at all. Although I like my city and state leaders. They seem to actually have some plan. But anyway, the states are now just going to open up. And so this is uh, an interesting argument from, I guess, somebody I'd regard as pretty much on the right. The first thing is not very many people are going to die. The risk of death is less than 1%. He said so that might be true. Uh, the second thing is he thinks you can somehow protect older people so you don't go in the hospitals very much, although I don't know how you can do this, lock up the older people. But then, of course, there's herd immunity. This is a big issue. The tests are showing some people have like 20% or more of the population already infected. And if that's true, then I guess you might as well open up because all chance of containment is gone. And the only thing you can go for is herd immunity. Now, once 40% of the people catch it, then supposedly it will stop spreading because that will lower R. That is a claim. That's what Britain had and Sweden had. And then, um, uh, so this is, this is a claim. We can have targeted measures, although as far as I can tell, those are not defined. So there, this is the argument for just opening up. And it seems to me like nobody wants to openly say what they're saying, which is, oh, who needs those old people anyway? Just let them die. But um, it might be that we don't have any real option other than just letting it spread. It is, I'm, anyway, so McConnell is saying, now when they're opening several states, they last week and this week, they're all opening up. And of course that means, uh, they say it's so businesses can stay in business. But what it means is the employees are forced to go to work. They're forced to risk their health and that of their families because they will lose their insurance and unemployment insurance and everything. If they don't go to work once the business is open. So they're forcing them. And McConnell has been denying aid to states. And his catch is, that they will have to indemnify the businesses, that no business can be sued for forcing employees to go to work who then die and make their family sick. And I guess that's where we're going. So in retrospect, I don't know why we bothered shutting down at all. I mean, we're just gonna let it spread, do nothing about it. 
That's already uh, happening in San Francisco. Uh, companies are essentially making their employees sign something and either you come into work right now or uh, you are fired. But in San Francisco, we have a city order and a state order. To uh, so how can they do that? Because, uh, you know, I, I've noticed this with certain, you know, essential employees, which, you know, can include, uh, you know, building luxury high rises that you've bamboozled the building department into thinking uh, is going to be an affordable housing, which I found out there are a bunch of loopholes for that. Okay. Um, and uh, medical workers also, um, they're forced to go in. It doesn't matter if they have like 80 year old parents living at home. Um, they're essentially forced to sign something that says, okay, uh, until the end of the shelter in place, if you opt not to come into work, um, you'll, st you'll still keep your health insurance, but um, you go get on unemployment. Uh, and at, at the end of this, well, maybe you'll have a job, but probably not. Well, it is, uh, it is spectacular how we're, we're not doing anything about this at the national level. Uh, I kind of have some confidence in my local officials to do a reasonable job. I think our state and city will not open up until they actually have some kind of plan to lower the risk. Yeah, uh, one issue too with the herd immunity thing is, is there's really no confirmation that that's uh, an actual thing. Um, you know, we don't really know yet as far as, as that goes. And I think it's, it is interesting to note that um, scientists have said like, hey, with all the other types of coronavirus that we have, that isn't a thing, um, you can get reinfected. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think we, we're just really short on solid data here. We are, and, and what's amazing is no planning and no communication. The government right. just seems to rely upon ignoring it and lying about it. That seems to be their total response at the federal level. Anyway. Um, well, it's not entirely no communication. So this article that I have now, wow. actually one of the articles that li is linked from this um, talks about how uh, uh, Trump and Putin have been talking more than they have uh, any time since 2016, which well, I think is interesting. China. Uh, yeah, well, we're blaming it on China because that's politically expedient, but our, um, we're getting hammered on. Our, our health and human services uh, is getting hammered on by nation state attackers, uh, uh, several other government agencies and um, healthcare institutions are getting like an unprecedented, um, an unprecedented number of attacks right now. So, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, legislators are putting pressure on um, the NSA and CISA to step up their campaign. Um, they're already uh, they're already mounting a, a, a massive uh, uh, proactive proactive offense campaign uh, towards these attackers. Uh, well, they call it a defend forward posture. Uh, oh, but, uh, that's an term defend forward. Defense forward. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised that I don't hear more of this. This is a great time for crime and war. The nation, yep. military is shot. The security guards are shot. Everybody's at home. You could totally break into all the businesses and steal everything. I mean, yep. the cops are busy. I mean, I don't know why there isn't a huge crime wave of looting. Oh, That's there is. Don't worry, Sam. There is. There is. I think a lot of it goes unreported. At least here where I'm at, it does. Uh, because you'll you'll hear stuff or see stuff in progress, and then you know hear about it on the police scanner, and then it oh. never hits the news. Oh, well, I I think you're seeing you. So you've seen break-ins? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, geez, there was a murder. There was actually a murder uh, around the corner uh, a month ago, and it was never in the news until uh, the cops a month later finally put out uh, police sketches. Um, saying, hey, can you help us catch these guys that murdered the 17-year-old? And it's like, geez, it was never even in the news at all when it happened. Oh, yeah. You know, I used to live in a neighborhood like that, but not anymore. <laughs> so. yeah, there, there's the, the Citizen app that I, I use from time yeah. to time that tells you all the crimes that are going on around. And oh. yeah, the number of break-ins has increased recently. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would think so. Right. Business, although not at home, because everybody's at home. 
Right. No, I, but I'm in a in an industrial area, and I've I, I you know I, I it's crazy. It's been going on now for uh, like a month. It's been getting worse. Yeah. Yeah. Well. All right. And then we got Comcast. You have usage caps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how interesting that they uh, took out the cap because of all this, and uh, they're not <laughs> suffering. But they, you know, go back a year even, and they're complaining that hey, uh, too many people are using the internet, and we not we don't put these caps. Everybody's performance is gonna drop, and all all hell's gonna break loose, and the end of the world. But interesting that uh, that's not happening. It kind of reminds me of the FBI claiming they need to stoop in everybody's traffic or they won't be able to solve crime, and yet they can't point to a single case where that snooping actually helped. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, in this case, it's all about making money. It, it, oh, yeah. it's, th there's a reason why I don't use AT&T or Comcast for internet. I just got so fed up with their corporate shenanigans that I decided I didn't want to deal with them anymore. Yeah. And, and part of that was because of these ridiculous data caps. In fact, it was so bad. I was previously using AT&T DSL and that is slow. I mean, really, really slow, but it was cheap. It was, you know, $25 a month or something. Yeah. And they wanted to put data caps on that. It was ridiculous. Um, so I, I noped out of there as fast as I could. Um, and now I'm with a local provider, which has been just a, a dream. I mean, I pay through the nose and my speeds are, laughable but i'm um, the fact that i'm not with at&t or comcast is is fantastic yeah and you're lucky you're lucky to have that choice where i am though my uh one choice is uh at&t dsl i could get comcast if i paid twenty thousand dollars to run a cable drop around the corner and then paid them i can't remember if it was 350 or or i think it was around 350 a month for service. Wow. So how much is AT and T? Uh, AT and T is like uh, fifty a month or so, but it's so slow and it's 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 unbelievably slow and very unreliable because they never maintain. Voice keeps chopping up and stuff in these casts sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, they never maintain the switching stations, at least in my area. So it's just pretty much worthless. Yeah. So, yeah. So I I will I will give a um. Uh, some free promotion to my ISP because I really do like them. Um, I use Sonic. Yeah, um, and it, awesome. yeah, yeah. And, and they actually started at a community college uh, doing networking for the college and the local community. And they kind of grew out of there. And they do a lot of cool stuff. Um, like they, they run a lot of like Linux uh, update servers. So if, if you update Ubuntu or Arch, you can go onto the Sonic servers and stuff to get that. Um, like I said, it, it's expensive, but I, I absolutely love them. So, and they have a mesh network, which is yeah. super awesome. No, no, I don't think they have a mesh. They they act the way that they operate is they also have a mesh network. Well, um, there's like Monkey Brains, which has a mesh network. Um, uh, Sonic uses uh, fiber optics, or they go over AT and T's line. In fact, the way that they legally do that is they make you essentially buy a phone service with it so that they're a competing telecommunications service. Um, uh, so I have a telephone line I don't use, but I have to have it in order to get internet through uh, Sonic as opposed to AT&T. Yeah, I tried using Sonic and their service was spotty and I was like too far from the, uh, the hot zone. So my service was really slow. That's the thing, they're, they don't really cover the area very thoroughly. At least they didn't a few years ago. Yeah, no, my, my service, I mean, I've been really happy with the uptime. Um, we have well over 99% uptime uh, when my neighbors who use Comcast just the other day uh, are, are always complaining and I have to share my Wi-Fi with them because they just don't get stable internet. But Sonic has been great for me, so. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. lot of people love Sonic. I think it's very good if you're in the right location. Yeah. Hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll get some uh, fiber uh, to our house soon, but I've been waiting for years and it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Getting some what? Fiber. Fiber oh, optic. Right. Yeah, they do have some fiber. I thought around, maybe not in your area. No. Whatever happened to Google getting uh, fiber? Uh, Comcast. Well, I, 
Well, I, it was, I think it was Comcast, but it was also a bunch of NIMBYs too, because uh, people, people shut that down in San Francisco because um, they didn't want Google, which I kind of get, I guess they, they don't, they didn't want Google being in charge of that infrastructure. Um, but here we are, we don't have any fiber. One thing I thought was interesting that was when Sam and I went to um, Utah last year to do a conference, um, oh, I realized that Utah is just completely blanketed in fiber. And I mean, even out in the hinterlands in the middle of nowhere, they have uh, fiber and, because they made it a huge priority to, do, to put that infrastructure in. Um, we're really, California is really lagging behind on that. I think that's because of the government surveillance industry that's totally running in Utah. The giant data center archiving everything is in Utah. So I Probably. think tons of military money. That makes a lot of sense, actually. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I've heard that um, most of the FBI is Mormons. Their culture is very tied into the government. Mm -hmm. This sort of a straight-laced uprightness. Right? Well, I thought it was interesting I when I got the... Uh, I got the uh, uh, list of allocations for uh, what the colleges got out of um, out of money for uh, the relief, coronavirus relief. Um, the uh, BYU was second to the top. The top uh, the 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 top um, payout was to University of Pennsylvania, I think, hmm. and um, second highest was to uh, BYU. Yeah, that was interesting. Like somewhere around fifty-five million. Yeah. Well, here we got this one about number plate cameras in Britain. Right. So, like all modern industrial nations, uh, Britain uses automatic license plate readers to keep track of traffic, uh, give out speeding tickets, that kind of stuff. And the site that you go to to get this information. I uh, did not have a password or any sort of protection whatsoever. So anyone could go there, get street camera data, um, figure out who's breaking the laws, track cars and traffic, you know, basic privacy, cyberpunk, um, uh, dystopian future type stuff. So this is their management dashboard, but this was uh, not deliberately open to the world, right? It was just like an unsecured uh, elastic search or something? No, it was, uh, it didn't have a domain attached to it, so if you just go to the IP, okay. you can you can just grab that, grab everything. Okay, so it's amazing how anybody could set something up like that these days. I don't know. I mean, maybe they were thinking, well, because you need to know the IP, it's kind of like a you know, password, you know, the same way that I might put a something I don't want people to find in a folder with like random characters on a web server. Well, that's the way things were in like the 80s. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. But of course, that's, it takes a great bit of naivete to yeah. think that that's going <laughs> to save your data. Well, I remember when I taught Cisco, there's this COM port in the Cisco router, which is supposed to connect to your PBX. And that's the phone number to control the router, which was typically configured with no password because there was just a local phone number of the router. And that was considered enough security that you won't find that phone number. And, you know, in like the 70s, that was considered okay. Right. Well, pretty ridiculous. And so here's Amazon. These guys, um, I heard about this. Um, Amazon is accused of price fixing, which I must say, Apple's been doing this. I thought it was an open knowledge, not even a secret, that if you write an app and you propose it to Apple to put it in the app store, Apple will put it in clone it, then kick you out and sell their clone. And there's nothing you can do. And Amazon apparently does the same thing. Um, they take your third party sellers and they make a clone of your product and then undersell it. And now they say, when you go to the Amazon website and also Whole Foods, they say it's all full of Amazon branded clones. And that is uh, probably a violation of antitrust law or something. So they're uh, suing them about it. So what they, they take your application. Yeah. They copy it and sell it as their own? That, that that's, can't... What, that's what Apple does. See, Apple has rules of the store, and one of the rules of the store is you can't make an app that competes with one of Apple's apps. So if you write something great, they will put it in for a few months until they can make a clone, then they'll put out the Apple official app and kick you out, and you're Oh, out. oh, I get it. Okay, that makes sense. Also, it's, it's terrible and dystopian. Like if you move into China with Google, 
they will let you in for a while, force you to hire local Chinese people, clone Google, then kick you out and run their Google clone. That's how, that's how they operate. Got it. And apparently Amazon does the same thing. That's why, um, anyway, it'll be interesting to see what comes of all this. Uh, it is, I think, a huge problem in America that we're letting the tech monopolies grow bigger and bigger and bigger until they control everything and they're totally abusing everyone. And uh, we really need like Elizabeth Warren and antitrust laws to break them up. And it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon unless the Democrats win next time. I don't know. Biden can do it. But then we'll see what happens. Anyway, I guess that's it. Are any more comments? Nope. nope. I'm going to stop the recording then.